So uh, again, Luke chapter 4, verses 31 to 44. Let's hear God's word together now. And he went down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to help us this morning. We pray that you would give us clarity. Uh, we pray that you would help me as I speak and all of us as, uh, as we listen. pray that you would be at work in our hearts now. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Years ago, a friend of mine told me, he said, oh, look, man, you know you're getting old when you start smoking meat and when you start talking about World War II. Well, I've been smoking meat for about 10 years now, and about six or seven years ago, wouldn't you know it, I started getting into World War II history, a lot of it. So I guess I'm officially getting old, as some of y'all have told me. Uh, now, it, it doesn't take long reading about war history, whether it's World War II or any other conflict, uh, or you start reading about planning. So if the, the book you're reading is worth its salt at all, it's going to get into some of the details of how conflicts are planned. Uh, after all, things like the invasion of Normandy or Anzio Beach in Italy uh, or any other campaign didn't just happen one day. Uh, invariably, the author of the book, again, if they're a good historian, uh, will give us an overview of the mission that a military is planning to carry out. Now, they almost never go into any kind of extensive detail. Uh, I read a book once where they did, and it's mind-numbingly boring. Uh, but they give you a 30,000-foot view uh, to give you the contours of what the mission is going to involve. However... Uh, the author never stops there, right? Uh, he does go ahead and tell us what carrying out the mission looks like, again, in broad strokes at least, as it's carried out in time and space. Uh, so it does provide a bit of detail to what had been previously somewhat abstract. Well, Luke does something real similar uh, to those authors at this point in his gospel. So, during a visit to the synagogue in Nazareth, which we looked at last week, Jesus reads a passage from Isaiah, from chapters 58 and 61. Uh, he used those verses to describe what his mission would involve, proclaiming good news, literally gospel, uh, to the poor, liberty to captives and to the oppressed, uh, sight to the blind, release from economic ruin, as he speaks in terms of the year of Jubilee, which was uh, an economic relief system uh, designed in the Old Testament law. Uh, his mission, captured in concrete terms, was ultimately about bringing freedom, hope, peace, joy, and the forgiveness of sin through his work. That's what he's telling them. But what would that look like on the ground in real time? Well, that's what Luke shows us in today's passage. And this, in turn, would form something of an outline for the rest of Jesus' earthly ministry. So even today, as we go through all of our points, I'm going to be providing some background detail 
some of which I won't hit on again a lot through the rest of Luke because there's a lot of all of these things that we're going to discuss today that happen in Luke. And so rather than uh, going into each one of them in detail every time that we hit upon one of these things, I'm going to really try to lay the foundation of the house today uh, so that we'll be able to see all, all of this clearly as it plays out throughout Luke's gospel. I hope that'll make sense as we go. So let's break down our time like this today. Uh, first, confronting the enemy. Second, healing the sick. And finally, preaching the kingdom. Okay, so confronting the enemy, healing the sick, and preaching the kingdom. Uh, and by the way, you may wonder why I, I structure things like I do with uh, the points, usually three points or whatever. Not trying to be fancy or clever. It's just easy way to remember stuff, okay? So that's why, you know, there's freedom in structure, so trying to structure things rightly for us. So let's jump in first with confronting the enemy. Uh, look with me at verse 31 again. Luke tells us, and he went down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee. Okay, so Capernaum was actually on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is about 700 feet below sea level. So anywhere you would have come from, you would have been going down uh, to Capernaum. So that's what's happening here. Remember, uh, Jesus had already been in Capernaum before visiting Nazareth. That's, that was actually mentioned almost parenthetically in last week's passage that we looked at. He'd already been there and had apparently done some noteworthy things because the Nazareth congregation that's you know, 20 miles or so from Capernaum uh, has heard about what he did at Capernaum. So he's apparently already got something of a track record there. So now he's back in town uh, and he keeps his established pattern of attending the synagogue service. Uh, so still in verse 31, and as he was teaching them on the Sabbath, they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. Now, last week we saw the Nazareth crowd uh, marveled at his words. Okay, They were impressed by his oratory. Now, very clearly by their response to him, they didn't believe much of what he said, but they were just impressed by his rhetorical skill. Well, here Luke says something similar about these people's reaction. Okay, It says they were astonished, but the reason for their reaction was different. Look back at the text. For his word possessed authority. So when rabbis would teach in the, the first century, um, any, any time historically around that, that time period, when they would teach, they would make it a point to not be novel. They didn't want to be original. They weren't seeking to be clever. They would always base their teachings upon the authority of others who had gone before them. Uh, so, for instance, Rabbi Eleazar uh, wrote this. He said, uh, Nor in my life or ever in my life have I said a thing which I did not hear from my teachers. And that was a common attitude among early rabbis. Jesus, however, doesn't do that. He's in total control. Uh, as commentator Daryl Bach put it, quote, Jesus would handle the text directly and independently. His word alone was sufficient. So Jesus isn't appealing to what so-and-so said or what so-and-so said. He's saying, this is what I'm telling you is right. And people are impressed by that. They've never heard anything like this. Well, in, in the middle of everybody's astonishment at Jesus' handling of Scripture, something else astonishing and unexpected happens. Verses 33 and 34. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Uh, the other night, Joaquin and I were watching some clips uh, from the movie Nefarious. Anybody seen that? It's a 2023 film uh, about a demon-possessed death row inmate in Oklahoma. Uh, though the content is extremely dark, uh, it's actually a Christian film, and it gets most things right theologically. Uh, at one point in the movie, uh, this psychologist who's been called in, or psychiatrist who's been called in by the prison to assess uh, James, who's the, the condemned, to assess his fitness for execution. Uh, James can't quite figure out what's going on with this guy. What's is he multiple personality disorder? What's happening? Uh, so he calls in a priest. And so this priest comes in, and it's very clear uh, that the uh, priest doesn't believe in demons any more than, than, uh, than, the, uh, than the psychiatrist does and uh, certainly doesn't believe in demon possession. He says that they are just metaphors. And so that's how he, he tries to calm the condemned and calm the psychiatrist. 
Well, that's how a lot of people, at least in the postmodern secular world, think about the idea of demons and possession and things like that. Um, now, listen, that's definitely not the case in most of the world. Uh, in fact, it's, even in the Western world, according to statistics, about 70% of people believe in demons and demon possession. Uh, but in the rest of the world, uh, particularly in the Far East and in Africa, uh, the idea of the d demonic and demon possessions are just taken as a given, uh, as throughout history uh, that has been the case in cultures high and low, uh, what we would consider advanced and not advanced. Um, but, it, but here in America, that is sometimes uh, the case, often the case. People see any talk of demons uh, as nothing more than scary stories or misunderstood mental illness. Uh, and of course, that can be the case. Uh, sometimes tales of demons are just that. They're tales trying to scare people. Uh, and people have been misunderstood uh, for being demonically possessed or oppressed uh, when in fact they were dealing with a psychiatric issue. I actually know someone that that happened to. Uh, in fact, uh, when he was growing up, uh, the, uh, the, the elders at his church were convinced that he, was, um, that he was possessed and it turned out he was actually uh, schizophrenic and that caused a lot of, a lot of damage. Uh, however, just because the category of the demonic and demon possession, because those categories are sometimes misapplied, doesn't mean that they are not a reality. Uh, in, in fact, I'm reading a book right now by Dr. Richard Gallagher. He's a full tenured uh, professor of medicine at Cornell, uh, trained at Yale, and uh, the, the book is actually about demonic possession and his experience working in that realm uh, with pastors and priests. So these things do happen, and uh, they, they may not be that common, but they do. Uh, and during Jesus' ministry, overtly demonic activity like that was in overdrive, just as it was during the early church and in areas around the world today, especially where the gospel's advancing rapidly. So you hear this in places where maybe the gospel's not been preached, and now it is being preached, and these kinds of things are, are frequent uh, and happen regularly. So on this day in the synagogue, uh, a demon is residing in one of the congregation, and he explodes with this mix of a jeer and an unintentional testimony to Jesus' identity. He knows who Jesus is all too well, far better than anybody else in attendance that morning. In response, Jesus shows him just how far his authority extends. Verse 35, but Jesus rebuked him in authoritative verbal pronouncement, okay, saying, be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. So all Jesus has to do is speak the word, and the demon is forced to leave the man. So Jesus didn't have to cast a spell. Uh, he didn't have to coax him out. He just rebuked him, told him to get out, and he left. Again, the people are stunned. They can't believe that Jesus is able to do something like this. So word about him spreads like wildfire. And in short order, he's doing it again. Look down at verse 41. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. Now, as a little bit of an aside, that might sound kind of weird. That might sound kind of weird. Uh, why wouldn't Jesus let the demons speak of his identity? Uh, he made the demon in Capernaum be quiet. He does the same thing there in verse 41. Uh, Jesus, who of course knows his own identity, doesn't want anybody else to, to be able to define what that entailed. Uh, that some theologians and scholars call this the messianic secret. You see it especially a lot in the book of Mark, uh, where Jesus will tell people, tell demons, don't, don't tell people who I am. Don't tell people who I am. See, he knew that if people heard others, be those demons or humans, uh, speak of his identity in the wrong way or at the wrong time, that their own hearts, their own imaginations would fill in the blanks of what exactly that involved or what it should involve. Now, that shouldn't sound uh, unusual to us because we do that same thing all the time when we think about Jesus. Like, we'll kind of think about Jesus and then just download things about him that we want to be true, whether or not the Bible says it's true. Oh, well, Jesus would surely love what I'm doing here, or Jesus would surely love what I'm doing there. Jesus must you know, put the stamp on anything that, that my life, what I want it to be, okay? We know what that's like. Jesus knows how people are. But in his own time and in his own way, he says, I'm going to set the terms of my identity 
and my mission, which is why he's constantly, you see him telling, again, whether it's demons or people, don't say who I am. So soon enough, it's going to be obvious and it's going to be clear. As we see here, a huge part of that mission, an outworking of what he had read from Isaiah when he was in Nazareth, was confronting the enemy, punching Satan in the teeth, freeing people he loved from oppression as he does these people. Now, by the power of God's Spirit, uh, Jesus continues to do that same thing today. Okay? Sometimes it takes overt forms, uh, like we talked about a moment ago, especially in those areas of the world with heavy occult presences, uh, like we just spoke about. Uh, sometimes, most of the time, in fact, though it's more subtle. It's more subtle uh, as the power of the Spirit moves through the preaching of the gospel. The enemy is pushed back, beaten down, smashed as God is bringing people's salvation and deliverance from any number of issues that have demonic roots or influence, whether we recognize it as such or not. Like only time, only history, only eternity will show precisely where God was doing those things. Jesus confronts the enemy every day, and he's undefeated. Okay? He's undefeated. He's always precisely accomplishing what he sets out to accomplish. But his mission didn't only involve confronting the enemy. It involved healing the sick, and we're going to look at that now. Uh, several years ago, I was at a conference uh, where one of the breakout sessions was led by an elderly pastor. I was elderly. He wasn't elderly. But he was an older pastor, a long time, been in the pulpit for decades, a uh, faithful brother. Um, he described several instances, and we're, again, in a, in a breakout, not much bigger than our group here, breakout session, and he described several instances in the history of his church uh, where people had been spontaneously healed of serious illnesses uh, after the congregation had prayed. And uh, these were not done in a corner, lots of witnesses, uh, people who saw the healing, people who knew uh, the various illnesses, cancer, whatever, that folks were facing. Uh, so a lot of witnesses to these things. Uh, the pastor wasn't telling us any of this to gloat or to build his brand. He wasn't offering some kind of magic healing formula, no anointed prayer cloths for 1995, like none of that. He's just an older brother sharing with younger brothers about what God sometimes chooses to do through the prayers of his people. And he encouraged us uh, to seek and pray for those same things in our own churches. And why wouldn't we do that? Right? I mean, after all, we follow the healer. We follow the healer. Remember when Jesus read from Isaiah that day in Nazareth, he said that his mission involved, quote, recovering of sight to the blind. So while his mission uh, was not limited to physical healing, it would include that in many cases, and sometimes, of course, in the Gospels, the healing of, of literal blindness. So Luke gives us a glimpse of what Jesus' healing ministry involved. Verse 38, And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now, church history says, and, and modern uh, archaeology seems to confirm, that uh, in Capernaum, where, where the, uh, like the synagogue and Peter's home were, like basically next door to each other. Okay, uh, so he enters Simon's house. Now, Simon's mother-in-law uh, was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. Uh, so high fevers, of course, have always been serious, especially for adults. Uh, in fact, some Greek scholars argue that this word behind high fever was actually a technical medical term. Uh, so it's really high fever and often with dysentery. So again, in, in the first century world, this is a potentially fatal ailment, okay? So she's not just like, oh, I'm running on 101. I'm going to stay in bed today. This is not that, okay? This is a potentially lethal situation. So Simon, again, Peter, uh, likely along with his wife and or kids, uh, asked Jesus to intervene. Uh, Jesus, again, showing his authority, rebuked, it says there in the text, rebuked the fever, uh, now, some New Testament scholars would say that in using the term rebuke, that this fever uh, was actually the result of some sort of demonic activity. That may be the case, or it may just be an especially evocative way of describing Jesus' power, that he can simply speak a word and whatever the thing is has to heed his voice. For instance, over in Mark chapter 4, uh, it says that Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves and that they calmed down. In any event, 
As soon as he speaks, she is immediately healed, and she does what any first century Jewish woman uh, would have been anxious to do. She serves her guests that are in her home. Uh, but she's not the only one to receive a healing that day. Verse 40. Now, when the sun was setting, okay, because remember it was a Sabbath uh, that Jesus had been at the synagogue, then he goes over to Simon's house. It's still the Sabbath, heals, heals uh, Simon's mom, Peter's or mother-in-law. And during the daylight hours, though, people are not going to be bringing uh, people to Jesus because they would be carrying a burden, which the Pharisees had said was against the Sabbath law, so they wouldn't have been coming. But as the sun is setting, the Sabbath is ending, so then people start bringing uh, bringing their family over. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, <clears throat> and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Can we stop for a second and just like put on the imagination cap? Like, can you imagine the buzz around Capernaum that day? Like, we read things all the time in the Bible, and they, you know, kind of flowers. Think about. Can you imagine what things must have been like? I mean, this is not a huge city; it's a pretty small town. Can you imagine what things would have been like? People who have loved ones with all sorts of ailments, probably some minor and others life-threatening, hear that there is a man in town who's already been in town once and done great things, a man in town who can heal their friends and their family. He's already healed Simon's mother-in-law. She's up serving people for crying out loud. So what can she, what, what, what can he do maybe for my people? Like, can you imagine the gears turning? Think about if somebody, if there's someone you love who has a serious ailment, and you're thinking, man, walk down the street and they can, they can be healed? Think about that for just a moment. So as quickly as they can, they're rounding up their loved ones, a, a crutch placed under an arm here, a stretcher carried there, and they are getting them to this Jesus that everybody's talking about. And how does he respond? The text says he healed them. In doing that, he's, he's building his resume. Okay, He's showing uh, what he, he's saying. Okay, here's, you know, remember at the, at the synagogue in Nazareth, he had read, what he would do as Messiah, and now he's giving concrete examples of that as he's doing these healings. He's demonstrating his authority and his identity, but he's also practically loving those people whose bodies and maybe minds are broken. That day was the day that a lot of lives were changed in ways they could not have imagined. I want you to notice something else, though. It's, it's easy to gloss over in the text. Not only does he heal them, but look at how. Okay, look back at your Bible with me if you've got one. Look down. Look at how he chooses to heal them. What does it say? He laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Now, we know from other healings he performs, including Simon's mother-in-law earlier that day, that he didn't need to lay his hands on anybody to heal them. Likewise, this was not a normal procedure uh, in Jewish tradition. If someone was he praying for the healing of a person, that didn't, I mean, they're scattered cases over thousands of years, but that was not the norm. That's not what people did. And yet Jesus did that. In fact, he does that frequently in his ministry. He'll, he'll touch people. He'll touch people. Uh, Dr. Paul Brand was one of the world's foremost hand surgeons. In fact, he literally wrote the book, I, I mean, the textbook, uh, first one, major one, on hand surgery. Uh, he's from the UK. Uh, but later in his life, though, he moved to Louisiana to work in a leper colony. Believe it or not, there's a leper colony in Louisiana. And he moved there, not unlike Father Damien, who I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, who had moved, uh, the Catholic priest who had moved into a leper colony in Hawaii. <clears throat> but Dr. Brand's role was different. So he wasn't in the colony as a pastor uh, he was there as a physician, albeit a Christian physician. And he was known for diving right into this little town of patients. Um, he touched them often, seemingly with reckless abandon. In fact, he was known for, like, he, he would touch them and work on something, not even wash his hands. And then he'd eat. All these sorts of times, he, he was known for, for touching these people physically, many of whom had probably not been touched by anybody in years. But why did he do that? Because they were people. And he was a person. And he knew what a kind touch could do for them. How it conveyed that they were loved and that they were not alone. You know what that's like, probably. You ever been on the receiving end of a, of a pat on the back? Or a big hug when you were really down? 
How'd that make you feel? Exactly, right? Makes you feel warmed, warm, cared about, known. Uh, that, I believe, is what Jesus is conveying here. Uh, his touch is a subtle, subtle, yeah, but beautiful action that reassures these people, that lets them know that they are known, that they are seen, that they are loved, that shows them how close, how approachable, how good he is. Facts that would, would only be more significant as his identity and mission were further clarified. So think about it. Uh, that day, they were just happy to be healed, right? Like any of us would be. But as it became clear that he was the Messiah, as they started hearing more stories about him over the next couple of years, how do you think that would have impacted them? As they tell people, hey, I got healed. I didn't know who this guy was, really. I just knew he was a traveling rabbi. That dude that everybody's calling the Messiah now, he healed me. Can you imagine how that would have made them feel? For those who would eventually come to trust him, not only as the Messiah, but as, the, as God in the flesh, how that would have impacted them. See, it would have shown them what God is like. He's the God who reaches into the lives of ordinary, broken, sinful people, and he touches them. Uh, beloved, every other faith system sees their deities, uh, Allah or the deities of folk religions, uh, as almost allergic to humans never getting too close to them. People are either too little, too bad, or too much of a bother. Even the Hindu gods or the New Age spirits who are conceived of as being in everything never, never reach out to truly know or serve people. It just doesn't happen. Read all you want in the face of the world. This does not happen. But here Jesus is not only healing people, but laying, laying his hands on them touching them. See, that's the kind of God we serve, the kind of God the Bible says that Jesus is. Healing the sick was part of Jesus' mission, and sometimes we see not only his power over sickness, but we get a special glimpse of his heart toward those he heals. As we're going to see throughout Luke, Jesus physically healed a lot of people, and he still does that today for people, sometimes through spectacular means, like I mentioned a few moments ago with the pastor that I was talking about. Uh, at, at, the, at his church, uh, you, you may have been on the recipient of that kind of healing, or you might know someone who has. Uh, sometimes he heals through more ordin ordinary means, all right? Doctors and diet and medicine, surgery, exercise, counseling. Uh, either way, praise God, right? Like, I don't, I'm not particularly worried about how people get healed. Like, I just, just like it when they're healed. <clears throat> By all means, we should pray for healing and pray for it often. That's why we have a prayer list, one of the main reasons, okay? Like we write those things down, we mean to pray for them. And we really do want God to work, and we are asking God to work. Sometimes, probably more often than we think, God will bring deliverance in those things. Again, only eternity will bear all that out. But sometimes for his own good purposes, he does choose to only bring partial healing or maybe no healing at all. Okay, he chose not to heal Timothy of his recurrent stomach ache that Paul refers to, his stomach issue that Paul refers to. Uh, he doesn't heal Paul of whatever kind of malady that he spoke of in 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, in those moments, just as when he does choose to heal, whether he does or whether he doesn't are motivated by the same thing, his love for us. I know that can be hard to hear sometimes when we just want to get better. I get it. But he's doing those for our good, for his glory, for purposes bigger than we know about. So no matter how he chooses to act in the realm of physical healing, though, remember what I said last week when we were looking at the Isaiah passage that he quoted in Nazareth. The ultimate fulfillment of all of these things that he discusses, healing and liberation and freedom from indebtedness, those are all signposts. They're all pictures of what we need most. Healing, deliverance from the cancer of sin. Okay, that's the main picture that's going on here. And Jesus brings that to all who trust in him. So that's not a, yes, I'll bring that to some and not to others. That's for all who trust in him fully and freely. And when he does, when he does that, he's not merely touching us, as wonderful as that will be. And look, if your hope is in Jesus one day, that's going to happen. Okay, that is going to happen. But even greater than that, he doesn't merely touch us here. He fills us with his spirit who's constantly preaching to us 
who Jesus is, who we are in him, preaching all the time over and over and over again that Jesus is better. Broken record in our hearts. That's what he's doing. So just as with confronting the enemy, uh, healing the sick was a part of Jesus' mission, but none of that was in isolation. Uh, it came along with a message, and that's what we're going to look at now briefly, uh, preaching the kingdom. Uh, have, have you ever had one of those times, uh, and if, if you've followed Jesus long, you probably have, where you just needed to get away and pray? Like you're maybe overwhelmed with something, or there's just too much racket, too much noise, you know, man, I, I got to go. Uh, if you haven't had one of those, you probably will. Uh, and if you have, you're in really good company because <laughs> Jesus did that regularly throughout his ministry. You see it throughout the Gospels. As we head into verse 42, see that very thing. Think about it. So Jesus had been spent. He had been wrung out over the last 24 hours. I mean, he preached. He ended up performing a bunch of exorcisms, and he healed who knows how many people. I mean, good grief, y'all. I'm tired after an ordinary Sunday morning. I get home, I just want to take a nap. And uh, <laughs> look at all he's done. But you might think, well, he's God in the flesh, though. He can handle all that, no problem. But don't forget, don't forget, he is also fully human. We've talked about this in this series. He's fully human, subject to the limitations of fatigue and hunger and energy expenditure, just like we all are. He must have been exhausted, even if he had a good night's sleep after all that action. So what does he do? Verse 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. Now, the text doesn't say what he was doing there, but the parallel passage over in Mark's gospel says specifically that he went to pray. He's talking to his father. He's asking for help, being strengthened, being prepared for the next part of his mission. But he's not alone for long. Now, if, if you've ever been praying, if you're, if you're a parent, ever had small kids, you know this. You're praying and Small child, like DEFCON 1 emergency happens right in the middle of it. Uh, or you get maybe like a, a phone call from work or something like that. Something's always going to jump in uh, to, to get in the way of your praying. Uh, this is kind of what's going on here with Jesus. It says, and the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. Now, you can imagine that they don't want him to leave, right? I wouldn't want him to leave either. Man, it's a, he's handy to have around. <laughs> you would not have wanted him to go anywhere. Uh, think about how much things have changed since this time yesterday. In fact, Mark tells us uh, in the parallel passage that it was Simon, that it was Peter who was leaving the crowd. Sounds like Peter, doesn't it? Uh, his mother-in-law has a new lease on life. This is, this is Peter's hometown, and suddenly a bunch of his friends and neighbors are walking around and talking and seeing. Uh, for all we know, he knew the demon-possessed guy in the synagogue that day, and he may have known him quite well. And now things are better, way, way better. So you can see why everybody wanted him to stay. Jesus' mission takes him elsewhere, though, verses 43 and 44. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So he can't stay. He has good news to preach, to proclaim. He needs to tell people about, quote, the kingdom of God. Of God. Now, that's a, a massive category in Scripture. It's a sermon of its own, uh, and it's Jesus' favorite topic. He talks about it all the time. Uh, in short, it simply refers to this. Uh, the kingdom refers to God's rule and reign in the hearts and lives of his people. Okay, so it's not talking about a geography. It's talking about uh, a scope of his reign. All right, as uh, Leon Morris, scholar Leon Morris says it like this, that, that the kingdom is, quote, God's rule in action. So this kingdom, according to the New Testament, has an already aspect, okay? So it's, it's gradually being realized in people's lives as they come to know and trust Jesus. Uh, it also has a not yet aspect, though, as the kingdom is only going to be fully realized at Jesus' return. So he begins a preaching campaign, takes him far and wide, far enough, in fact, that if you notice, the broader term Judea is used there in the text. He had actually been preaching north in Galilee, but it's kind of a catch-all, broader phrase. Uh, Judea means kind of north and south. See, he's preaching all over the place, not just the immediate vicinity of Capernaum. Now, I, I don't want you to miss this. Listen again to the note of urgency in what Jesus says. Okay, look back at your text. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God, for I was sent 
for this purpose. All right, Jesus uses that phrase, for this purpose, only three times in his entire ministry that we know of that, that's, that's recorded. Okay, one is here, one's in John 12 when he says that he came to suffer and die for his people, and one is in John 18 where he tells Pilate that he came to bear witness to the truth, which meant the truth about himself and his mission as Savior. Everything Jesus did in his life, his death and resurrection was about saving sinners, about saving people like us. He must preach, he tells the Capernaum crowd. Uh, he was sent to tell people what life looks like when they bow to God's gracious rule, to tell people fundamentally about himself. Literally, because as he says in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To this day, the least politically correct phrase uttered in human history. See, Jesus is the one who brings us into God's kingdom through his death and resurrection on our behalf. But only if we trust him. Only if we trust that he really did die in our place and for our sin. That he really did rise from the dead, which is showing us that we will too if we hope in him. See, Jesus' entire preaching ministry reached its culmination at the cross and at the empty tomb where we see God's heart for people like us. That's the heart that welcomes us into his kingdom. That's what he's preaching. That's the message he was sharing then. That's the message by God's grace he's sharing for us now. My prayer for all of us right now as we finish up is that we'll look to him and run to him today, that it's good news and it's true good news. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning and we pray that by your Holy Spirit's power that you would uh, give us faith, give us trust that what Jesus did, he did for us, that he really did uh, confront the enemy, he really did heal the sick, he really did proclaim the gospel, the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel uh, that really is tied up in him. So Father, point our hearts back to Jesus today. Give us confidence in him. Thank you for showing us Jesus. Thank you for your word that tells us about him. So help us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.